finally effectively made the area safe. Uh, scenes of crime investigators, police and fire officers will be able to examine uh, the scene, examine the rubble, uh, to get some kind of clue as exactly how, when and where this fire started. And we expect that to be uh, around midday tomorrow. Four people still missing, uh, one man killed, five others injured. That's the stat so far, is yes. it? That's absolutely right, and uh, the priority now for the investigation will be to establish exactly who uh, those four missing people are still unaccounted for uh, and what happened to them. But I have to say there is a growing expectation tonight that when scenes of crime investigators do finally get access to uh, the rubble, to what is left of the Penhallow Hotel, um, those four still missing will finally and rather sadly uh, be accounted for. And Alex, it must have been a, a tough decision to decide to demolish that building before the missing people were located. Yes, absolutely. I think the more the dilemma there really was uh, the fact uh, that by demolishing the building, yes, they were effectively making it safe, reducing the danger to the public. There was an exclusion zone in place. Parts of the building did collapse during the day, so they absolutely had to, as a matter of necessity, make the area safe. But by so doing, um, there wasn't any real thought that there could be still people be, uh, be in there, but the problem that they faced was by demolishing the building, they could potentially have compromised the investigation uh, and any possible clues or leads uh, as to how or why this fire started. So that was the dilemma that they wrestled with, but they, they decided in the end that for public safety alone, they did have to, to, to make the building effectively safe. What is this talk, Alex, just finally, about a, a burglary at the hotel on Friday night? Well, this is an uh, interesting uh, lead that came out this evening. Uh, Superintendent uh, Barry Frost from Devon Cornwall Police uh, confirmed to me that uh, there had been a report of a burglary around 7 in the evening. He said, interestingly, nothing seemed to have been stolen. Uh, but as a matter of course, they obviously want to find out as much as they can about that crime in order to eliminate it from the wider investigation into the uh, cause of this fire. But I have to say, tonight, there is uh, still no way that the police can rule out foul play they can rule out arson, and that will be yet another uh, lead that they'll be pursuing in the morning. Alex, thanks very much. That's our correspondent, Alex Bushell, uh, live at the scene. 22 minutes past 10. Let's come back uh, to our phone-in then this evening, the climate protesters. You're going to hear about this all day tomorrow. They're calling it a day of direct action. 0500 909 693. Uh, let's hear what you think. Harry in Yorkshire, first call on this. Hello, Harry. Uh, hello there. The, 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 these protesters, they, they really do incense me. They're targeting something, and I'm sure they're in league with the government, and I'll explain that remark when, when I come to the end. They go on about carbon, CO2 emissions. All they have to do is ban MIG welding, metal inert gas, all use CO2. That's all your fabbing shops, your garages, etc., etc., your jobbing welders, etc. They won't ban it. It's, like I say, it's an... It's an earth gas that, that shields the welding. There are thousands and of them out protesting tomorrow, uh, there's, Harry, there's, because oh, they feel but, they're not being listened to and they feel this is crucial the, for future generations. But with, with all due respect, there's millions of uh, CO2 welding sets that's throwing CO2 up into the atmosphere. Harry, thank you. Richard in with Cornwall. The, Richard, good evening. Hi, good evening, yeah. Um, I suppose I'd just like to say that, however... Um, well-intentioned um, the protesters are, and I'm speaking as someone who's made a massive effort over the last 20 years to always police the number of plastic bags he picks up at Tesco's, they're just wrong, because the guy from the Pilots Association is right. Number one, um, if we stopped air travel tomorrow, we wouldn't save the planet. Number two, if we stopped air travel tomorrow, the world would collapse. I'm not just talking about um, politicians and tourists. I'm talking about um, the goods we eat, the goods we buy, the technology we export, and the way we live our lives. And I just think it comes down to the fact that it's just another bandwagon that's been jumped on. Why can't they actually protest against the lack of information we have in this country as to what we need to do? For well, example, just very quickly, I remember when Clarkson said on, I may talk here or something, um, that cows do more harm than human beings. And for about two years, environmentalists slated him for it. Suddenly it's a big news issue. Oh my God, suddenly the guy's right. And the fact is, is that this is just another bandwagon. Of course aeroplanes are bad for the environment. Why don't we let one of the protesters actually speak to you, Richard? Mm -hmm. Alan Gill. Alan. Hi. Hi, Hi Alan. Hello. Richard's Hi. saying it's just too late. No, I'm not. 
But I am saying that it's we need to look at what we actually need to do because I think banning air travel or or massively restricting it basically collapses the world and doesn't save the planet. Well, um, it depends what you mean by collapsing the world here. I mean, Mm. the the, the peer-reviewed science is very, very clear that it, you know, we, will, we run the risk of runaway climate change. The problem is out of our hands if we don't get sort of below 450 parts per million equivalent within years. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Yeah. And so in order to do that, we need a 60% global cut within 30 years. Absolutely agree. Now, how, how are we going to do that? Because if we're going to share that out equally amongst everyone on Earth, that means for the over-emitting nations like us, that's like a 90% cut within mm-hmm. 30 years. Now... If, you, if we, like, closed every power station and we never moved about at all, aviation would account for all of that and more besides, as it stands. So aviation has to be cut right back. And if we don't do that, we are committed to runaway to climate change. And you want to talk about the world collapsing, that's the one. There's a Christian Aid report that came out recently saying 180 million people in sub-Saharan Africa alone would mm-hmm. die this century from climate change causes if we don't get this one in hand. Absolutely. You, know, correct, like, you want to talk about world collapse, that's it. And especially when we're doing it for something like, like aviation, the, you know, 99 flights out of 100, we don't actually need them. They're not essential. Um, well, I, I think know, that maybe, maybe, maybe it's 50, but, you know, we're, we're, you're probably better informed than me. But I think with great respect, what are you actually going to do? Because, of course, it's good to bring it to people's attention. But the reality of the situation is, is that it all comes down to money. You're not going to kill yeah. tourism. You're not going to curtail Blair, uh, Blair running around. However, there are reasonable things you can do. Why aren't you protesting, instead of against aviation and, and, and its proliferation, why aren't you protesting against private jets? Why aren't you protesting okay. against um, luxury jets? Why aren't you protesting well, against things that... You might be interested to know that the day before yesterday, people from the Camp for Climate Action uh, went and blockaded Biggin Hill and Farnborough, which are the two private jet airfields either side of London. I know, because, I know them well. But, yeah, because, okay. because there, are, there are these super rich people binge flying Jim, using private jets Jim, where you are. Okay, okay, uh, actually, Richard. But, uh, sorry, I, I just very, very quickly, I just think the point I'm trying to make is that what we've got to do is, or what you, with respect, anyone protesting has got to do is look at what's actually going to happen in reality. You're not going to curb holiday flights. You're not going to curb um, the majority of flights. But what you will do is you'll successfully limit and start to manage um, the carbon emissions per person flying. Richard, thank you for your call tonight. Jim McCausland, this is exactly the type of debate you're wanting to have, isn't it? Yes, it's very refreshing. Um, But I I think that uh, I'm concerned that some of the figures that, that Alan is using there um, we put out a report four months ago, uh, which we had drawn together based on a number of other scientists, including the IPCC report, and we said, this, this is our take on how things are, and I repeat the figures, global emissions from aviation between 2 and 3% likely to rise to be something like 6% by the year 2050, and this is man-made emissions, which are a very small proportion of the world's total CO2 emissions, most of which are natural. And we've asked for people to review this and say, are we right or are we wrong? And we haven't had a comeback from the campaigning groups at uh, Heathrow or or, or indeed from from groups like Friends of the Earth and and Greenpeace. And we want to have that debate because we think it's important to get it out in the open, to be transparent and professional about it, so that the world citizens can make up their mind about the best way in which we can save our planet. And frankly, our belief, looking at all that evidence, is that targeting aviation is not the best do, way of doing it. Do, do you, are you frightened that this protest tomorrow is going to be hijacked by militants and anarchists? Well, I, I was reassured to hear what Alan said, that they weren't targeting the runways tomorrow. I mean, Heathrow is fragile enough as it is, as you said, by way of introduction. Each August we have problems at Heathrow. And it's interesting that UK PLC, we've had four months now of campaigning about the inefficiencies of Heathrow, and now we're having campaigning about trying to shut down Heathrow. UK PLC has to make its mind up what it wants out of Heathrow. And we have a situation in this country where Heathrow is constrained by two pretty poor runways compared to most of the rest of Europe. It's making us inefficient. And frankly, the impact on the environment of aircraft having to circle around Heathrow waiting for a landing slot is such that it generates more carbon emissions than actually getting them in and out quickly on, on three decent runways, which is which is what the uh, the government's white paper was seeking. So it's it's not the sort of debate that lends itself to slogans, Stephen. We need to have a realistic debate, and I really do hope tomorrow we don't have any well, impact upon the runways at Heathrow. We don't have any incursions onto the runways. That would A, be very unsafe, but B, 
it would make 